はい、じゃあ、お願いします。本日はご。Thank you very much for joining us at the Robot Revolution and Industrial IoT International Symposium 2022 in your busy schedule. My name is Harayama from the Robot Revolution and Industrial IoT Initiative. I'd like to say a few words to open the International Symposium. This symposium is organized by RRI together with Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan and Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action of Germany. This symposium was first held in 2015 with the attendance of global leaders and experts to discuss robotics, industrial IoT, and its future vision and challenges and responses. Since 2020, we started online streaming of the event in English and Japanese to send out messages globally. This year marks the eighth symposium, and the theme of the first day is transformation of manufacturing in the digital era. The cases of digital manufacturing and digital ecosystem in Germany will be introduced. Followed by presentation and panel discussion on digital manufacturing from the perspective of system approach. With global challenges like crisis in Ukraine, COVID 19 pandemic, and climate change, digitalization and servitization of the manufacturing industry is occurring. How will manufacturing industry will change? Mr. Geller from Volkswagen and Mr. Hoibach from Catena X will introduce their initiatives. And Dr. Shirasaka will talk about manufacturing in the digital era. Now, I declare the opening of this international symposium. Now, let me introduce Mr. Sugie from Future Corporation. Who will be moderating today's session and panel discussion? Mr. Sugie was a moderator in the International Symposium last year as well, and he will be delivering a speech on business ecosystem on the third day in Japan Germany Expert Forum. Mr. Sugie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Harayama. I will serve as a moderator today. My name is Shuhei Sugie. I am in charge of open innovation at Future Corporation, and I'm the director of Innovation Laboratory as well. Thank you for having me today. I'd like to introduce the speakers in this session from Katena X Automotive Network board member and head of digital production of Volkswagen, Mr. Frank. Scholar and also the board member of Catena X as well, board member of Automotive Network, and head of Industry Business Unit of SAP SC, Global Vice President, Mr. Hagen Hoibach. And thirdly, we have Professor Seiko Shirasaka of the Graduate School of Systems Design and Management of Keio University. Professor Shirasaka will join us a little after 3.30 Japan time from the panel discussion. For those who are watching this session, there is one caveat I'd like to share before we start the session. Later for the panel discussion, you can ask questions. Please find the Q&A site from YouTube, find Slido site, where you can ask your questions, make sure you identify yourself and your association. Of course, you can ask questions in Japanese and also English as well. Your questions can be asked 
anytime during the presentations as well. Without further ado, we would like to start the presentation. First presentation is titled Digital Transformation at Volkswagen. So, Mr. Gala, please. Can you can you hear me now? Hello? So I can hear you. You can yeah, okay, very good. So you can hear me. So hello from my side. Uh, good afternoon. And I'm really um, proud to be here on the RRI symposium to present our digital transformation in Volkswagen and also the linkage of our transformation in Volkswagen towards the Catena X, um, the Catena X approach. Um, let me quickly start with Volkswagen. Um, I guess uh, you know Volkswagen as a, a car manufacturing company. We have, uh, we have a huge uh, network all around the world and uh, we have uh, over 100 production plants um, in the world producing over 8 million vehicles a year. And those production, uh, those production sites and factories are, how to say, leg legacy are uh, traditional ones. So they are not brand new, they are brownfield. And therefore the transformational um, um, necessity is very high on our side. And also our uh, former CEO, Mr. Herbert Dies um, started uh, a new strategy called New Auto 2021 uh, with a clear sentence, with a clear statement. Um, so it's time to reinvent ourselves. The reinvention here is not only talking about products, so cars, but also reinvent the processes and also reinvent uh, the mindset, how we produce car, how we run our business. A very important message and um, Oliver Blume, now the current CEO, is uh, taking this message also very clearly and is focusing on that as well. What does, what does this mean for production? So I'm a production person. I'm responsible for the digitalization in all factories and all brands in the Volkswagen Group. And um, we say this has to be a big jump to improve our activities. We have a clear understanding that uh, the today's performance curve is not supporting the future. If we continue like we have done in the last uh, yeah, decade, we will fail to succeed. We will fail to compete with all the new players in the automotive business, in the mobility business. Therefore, we have a clear understanding that the game-changing activity is needed. And game-changing means we need, we have to think about autonomous factories. We have to think how we can create a resilient production. We all know the crisis in the world and resiliency is very important in our supply chains and production processes. And another very, very important topic is um, the zero impact factory so that we do not pollute our environment, that we save our environment, all the resources and our factories shouldn't have impact, a negative impact to our um, global footprint. Therefore, we have a clear st um, strat strategic um, set of targets. And you see that on the left, we talk about that we want to half the effort, how we uh, produce cars. We want to double the speed, um, how to create new products, how to bring products to the market. We want to have zero impact uh, on the environment and we want to act as one team. Um, so that's a very clear message for us. And therefore we think about uh, scaling our idea to the whole network of uh, Volkswagen uh, Group. The main, the, the, the very first step is based on our legacy system. As I mentioned it, we have only brownfield factories in the world. Some factories are over 80 years old. The IT system sometimes are 30 or 40 years old. So really legacy systems. And those systems are monolithic, complex, and costly. So we have in, in, some, in some systems a very old software um, and um, a very 
uh, old style traditional structure to run the IT systems. And that was the reason why we have started um, three years ago the discussion with several partners and uh, inventors um, to think about a new structure. And um, the new structure for our IT systems introduction <clears throat> have to have a layered approach. We need clear separation of modules and a clear standardization of interfaces. Our platform thinking in the IT system will heavily change the way how we run our IT systems and how we run our, um, our uh, processes in the factory. And you see it here, it starts all in the physical process of production. So that means we have to understand how we create a full connectivity to the data platform, to our data management. And based on that platform, uh, then we can start with standardized applications, with standardized, standardized elements um, we can use for create use cases to improve our production world, to solve our problems. And the key, the key idea here of our applications is that they must be standardized like Lego bricks. So um, we have learned from our partner AWS that um, the usage of standardized uh, elements of standardized capabilities is the, how to say, the, the baseline, the fundament for creating new use cases and also for scalability. Because if we invent um, uh, an algorithm for, for example, um, deviation detection or deviation analysis, if we create this only once, we can use it with the standard linkage in several applications and in several solutions. And therefore, we have uh, worked the last three years to create the very first building blocks, building bricks, to um, uh, install first solutions in our factories. Um, the idea is that we do that in cooperation with several partners. And here you see the picture of the layered idea, what we are uh, setting up at the moment so that we take our shop floor where we produce our cars and our products. Um, we um, go into um, the connectivity question together with our um, outfitters like um, a, B, B, like Dürr for painting uh, with Siemens, a very big player in that topic. And we um, create a systematic approach how to uh, collect the data and how to aggregate the data in a standardized way to have the same semantic of data in all factories. And based on that data collection, then we can start together with uh, AWS, but also with other partners and with our own IT colleagues to develop our building bricks for our use cases. So building bricks can be advanced analytic topics or machine learning or deep learning activities, cloud applications, and for sure as well, um, data security activities and uh, solutions we also need for our production. And these are the elements in the platform and having those platform elements defined then the factories can start to produce or to create their own applications, their own solutions for um, uh, several problems. And here as well, we do not um, um, use only our factories. We also want to work together with different partners. As I mentioned before, um, outfitters like Dürr, outfitters like ABB, but also startups uh, can work together with us to create those solutions and to build up uh, new applications for our production. And I have one example here, um, a very uh, small uh, starting point uh, within the Porsche factories. Here, we had the problems <clears throat> with reading the labels in the car, sending the cars in dispatch uh, into our global markets to the customer. And here our um, German colleagues had very often the problem that they couldn't read the labels properly. So Japanese language is not so easy to read, for example, or the Chinese language. And therefore, um, we, they developed a very simple, easy device, the intelligent sign inspection, based on these building bricks, on these standards. And um, this idea helped um, quickly to improve the problems or to reduce the failures with the labeling in the cars. But that was only the starting point. 
based on this very first uh, sign inspection, so computer vision technology, um, the colleague said, let's use our standard um, building bricks in the application and create several applications um, with computer vision background. That means we have now um, created a, a, a so-called uh, workbench for computer vision technology and our factories can um, use the single elements to create their own application. And for example, in Wolfsburg, they have um, um, coded a own installation control assembly program to check the, um, the assembly of parts on the on the body in the in the um, assembly line. We have uh, created a tool for crack detection in uh, several press shops so that we don't need a manual inspection of the metal sheets so that the camera system can do that inspection. We have um, some deviation inspection uh, applications developed to see if a um, plastic parts are assembled properly. And also we have um, created uh, anonymization of images so that you cannot see which persons are working in the process because this is a uh, law site uh, not allowed in Europe. And therefore we also have to take care that people cannot recognize on images. So this is only a small example how we started with one application based on our standard tools. And um, using this then for further development of new solutions we can then um, bring into our factories. This sounds like that we need a lot of experts in IT and software coding, but it is not that way. Yes, we need IT experts, but we have created a so-called quick starter kit for all our factories that they can easily work with our technical platform. Um, we call this platform um, Digital Production Platform, DPP, and we have a kind of library installed in our internal uh, web that the um, factories can get the first introduction lessons in the, net, uh, in the web. They can download the first applications to work and to have a kind of sandbox account to check and trial out which solution, solutions can work for them, which solutions will help them to improve the problem. So this quick starter kit is available for all the 100 or over 100 factories with all the experts in their factories, and not only for our production colleagues, but also for logistic colleagues, for colleagues in the quality department. And um, if they start collecting the data in maintenance, in assembly on the shop floor, then they can work with the quick starter kit to build their first and own solutions. If they then need more expert uh, support, more IT support, then we also have labs, um, software development labs. We can ask for several um, helping steps or they can ask for support. So that is the starting point, how we want to transform um, all our factories towards a layered approach um, of our um, IT structure. The idea behind that, um, honestly, is copied more or less from the Apple idea. Apple, we know as a, uh, as a global player, very successful global player, and they say from the beginning, or they have said from the beginning, we give, the, we give developers a platform and we give the developers flexibility. And they want to um, welcome the competition on their own app store. So we don't need the um, competition on our app store, uh, app store, but we also want, as Volkswagen Group, we want to offer our internal developers and problem solvers, we want to offer them a platform with existing tools and building bricks. So if someone wants to do a own program or application on computer vision with deviation recognition and devi deviation analysis, then this person can use our digital production platform and the store with, the se with several tools available. As I said, we have started that three years ago. We are still in the beginning, but our store, our um, marketplace internally will grow and will offer year by year more solutions to our um, internal experts and problem solvers. But not enough, this is now the internal view. And we have thought about, is this also helpful for external partners and companies? And yes, we are 
um, we are uh, convinced that this idea is also helping other manufacturers and therefore we have um, uh, yeah, uh, defined the idea of the industrial cloud ecosystem. What does this mean? Um, developing these elements, developing these solutions, why shouldn't we offer those to not to externals and um, foster the open innovation process? If we have good ideas, other companies also have good ideas, and why not sharing that? And um, sharing that on a technical standard is um, then also helpful for us. And therefore, we said we want to have open innovation. We want to use our bricks, our building bricks for scaling. And we want to integrate our partners uh, in our value chain. And with that idea, we have now developed several ideas together with our partner, MHP, um, to, to offer also solutions to the external market. And here are the very first examples what we are offering to external partners. So if you as a produce, producing company, um, it is also possible for you to use that solutions to bring those solutions into your factory. Only one example, <clears throat> the alarm cockpit, if you check on the uh, top on the left side, the alarm cockpit was necessary for us because we have a brownfield set up we have old systems in our factories and different alarms are coming from different equipment pieces. So maybe the robot has a different uh, alarm signal as a conveyor system. And we have created a simple application to combine, to bring the alarms together. And the shop floor person, the shop floor worker then has a very quick overview where are the alarms coming from and what is the reason for the alarm. Another very important topic is the energy data reporting and analytics. Here, it is clear we, we have to save energy, we want to save energy, and this analytics is helping us to, to identify where do we have energy consumption peaks in the factory, where can we save, um, where can we save energy um, uh, during the shift times, and that is also one simple application we have developed and we are offering. This offering will grow within the next uh, years because if we invent solutions internally, we also check, can we offer these uh, solutions also externally? And finally, and that is bringing me then also to the external automotive industry system. Um, if we as Volkswagen Group have an internal platform, we have the digital production platform for our plants and for our brands. So we have solutions developed and we want to bring that solutions to, the, uh, to a standardized data ecosystem externally. And um, our solutions can, can then use by other OEMs and companies and um, suppliers. But the good idea and the good thing is having Catena X in the world, it is also possible to use then Catena X data chain to use the long data chains we are creating within Catena X and um, solutions will melt together. So having a, a data space created by Catena X with all the collaborating players here uh, is also helping other applications to get better results from the application, to get better solutions for improving the performance and for solving problems in the own uh, value chain and production uh, network. That is a quick overview on the transformation, the digital transformation in uh, Volkswagen uh, production and how we want to link it to the external world and especially how we want to link it uh, to the Catena X world. Thanks a lot for your um, uh, for, for listening and uh, maybe we have one or uh, two minutes left for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Goller. Uh, we will ask you questions uh, after the panel discussion. Thank you. The next presentation is by Catena X. Uh, the title is On the Way to the First Truly Open and Collaborative Data Ecosystem. Mr. Hoivak, the floor is yours. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, everybody. And thanks also to my partner in crime, Frank Göller, who actually could lead over immediately and seamlessly also to this presentation. And once again, from my side, first of all, a big thanks to the whole RI organization and the team for inviting us and uh, giving you a little bit insights what we're doing from our side on the Katia initiative. 
as I said before, I mean, Frank and me, we're sitting both on the board of Catena X. So both of us are responsible for the whole initiative, driving this from a global perspective. And I'd be, of course, super happy to give you some insights and what's the linkage also now from Frank's presentation going out from the classical manufacturing and all the innovations driven from a particular company over to a complete data ecosystem. So by saying that, and first of all, please apologize if my voice is still a little bit cracking up. I was literally yesterday completely without any voice. So I'm happy to, to also take any questions further and please apologize if there is any, any hiccups. So by saying that, and also the background of Catena X, it started exactly the one and a half, two years ago, where also Frank actually just leading over of saying, hey, we see in the companies, and it counts especially for the automotive industry, a lot of digitalization, a lot of automization over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, everything what we saw with Industry 4.0 and the initiative of saying, hey, we need to get better on the processes within the company, especially focusing from the manufacturing side, especially focusing on the automation there. This is all things what we have seen over the last 10 years. And let's be honest, it was great, great progress what we see there. Huh? A lot of new digital platforms are arising within the companies. A lot of different things which are coming from left to right together. And I think we can streamline and optimize there a lot of value potential for all the companies necessary. However, but this also what the especially last one and a half, two years has told us, there is more, and there is also more actually within an ecosystem of global supply chains, or I would even go one step further about even global value chains. And this especially counts for production and production relevant information. First of all, the big challenge about resilience. Everything what you have seen over the last one and a half years, and yes, the COVID crisis were the first signs where all of a sudden we have component manufacturing plants all in lockdowns and couldn't produce, while on the other side, automotive assembly lines were ready to produce. But guess what? The relevant components were not available and we have a lack of, okay, how to produce and when to produce. And this is really comes down when it comes to manufacturing and optimizing the manufacturing processes. Of course, we need to have uh, in focus the whole and global supply chains. Uh, and getting visibility about this supply and value chains, this is more than critical ever what we think. Why? Because on the one hand side, we can only drive resilience if we are more flexible and more flexibility comes also if we have the full transparency. And let's be also honest, I mean, having this transparency, we in the automotive world, we're doing this already. But on the one hand side, we are always doing that on a peer to peer approach. When informations are flowing along the cross uh, the complete automotive value chain, especially focused on manufacturing data, it's always peer to peer. So from an OAM to a first tier, from a first tier to a second tier, but never we have the full value chain in scope. And we also don't have it as a network based approach. So thinking about what we could do if we can send production or manufacturing related data through a complete value chain, and give all the players access to the data, suppliers, small, medium-sized companies, outfitters, manufacturing providers of machines, then we could have a complete new approach. First thing. Second thing, sustainability. All of the companies, and it's especially also for the manufacturing space, are committed to the sustainability goals of the UN. And we have a clear mission to get the whole system and all the operations better, which means if we're talking about carbon footprint data and carbon footprint neutrality, of course, we have to include all the production processes, but also the machines which are somehow uh, standing in the shop floors and try to extract the carbon footprint out of these machines. And guess what? If we're looking at the sustainability challenges there, it's the same challenge what we have in the first piece. We need to put together all the different data points across a complete value chain. So even further, we say in Catenex, from the recycler all the way down to the small and medium-sized companies. And we need to extract, for example, sustainability-relevant data like carbon footprint from A to B all the way up to the recycling and the OAM system. So connecting here the dots for the manufacturing and production-relevant data, this is really core critical. And even we go further, I think there is a huge potential also from a sustainability perspective, 
to implement new processes and new potential if we think about how can we actually drive and leverage our capacities in a better way along the complete manufacturing processes. Third big topic, what we addressed with CATNX is really how to foster a data exchange ecosystem. As I said before, data exchange, we are doing it in automotive since 30 years. Yes, we do it always peer to peer, but maybe we're also not doing it on the newest technology. And newest technology from our side would mean, now yeah, in the old world, if we would have built such a data exchange ecosystem, it would have pretty looked a little bit like on the left hand side, we would have built a centralized platform and said, no, everybody just should connect to this data platform, just dump the data, and then we have a nice exchanging ecosystem. But guess what? This is not how it's working with Catena X and also where we believe is not the future. Why? Data sovereignty and data sharing is a matter of trust and sovereignty by itself. We need to guarantee all the players of the automotive industry that you are at full control at any time of your data and you are fully in charge of who do I want to share the data, how do I want to share the data and how long I want to share the data. So what we pretty much proposed and that's also the guiding principle and the core idea, let's be honest, of CATNX. We're building a decentralized ecosystem where exactly the data should belong or stand where they are coming from within the proprietary data platforms of each company, of each player. And getting here the linkage to Frank's uh, industrial cloud or the digital production platform, this is exactly the linkage where we have. The digital production platform is providing the innovation, the nice apps, the use cases, but as soon as you wanna go out into that area and say, now I want to share this data through an ecosystem, then Catena X comes into play and you're at any time, at any in controls to put this together. And creating these thoughts about having the networks of networks because industrial cloud of Volkswagen is only one not in the big wide world. We have other big pl proprietary platforms coming from Siemens, coming from of course SAP, coming from other providers and outfitters and bring this world together where all these different platforms can speak the same language and share the data on a trusted matter. This was the basic idea. Huh? So, and last but not least, um, dealing with Catena X also means joining forces. Uh, we clearly see we are in automotive currently in a time of uh, a lot of pressure, a lot of challenges around new business models, material shortages, and also cost savings. And we truly believed creating such an ecosystem generates much, much more value if we all join forces at the same time now, we're sitting together at the same table and we're really sharing the effort and the shared burden at the end, what we said, to create such an effort. And this just means we're sitting together with industry adopters like OEMs, first tier, second tier, small, medium-sized companies, but we're also joining from an outfitter perspective, doesn't matter if it's IT or OT outfitter, we are really going in the same direction of providers and operators building this whole data-driven value chain and also the data ecosystem of Catenax. No? So giving us now this thought, and this is really now going away from, think about all the, I would say, vertical integration, what we have done and pushed uh, with Industry 4.0, especially in the manufacturing space over the last 10 years, now we're going into the horizontal layer and said we're connecting all the dots and you see it very nicely on the right hand side all the dots on the horizontal layer and putting the data chains together with all the different players around the automotive ecosystem and you already see it on the right hand side the world there is very heterogeneous from a digitalization and it perspective but also from an own it strategy of all the companies and we need to respect it there will not be the one platform owning all the data dots in there. It's more about getting the interoperability between trusted solutions and platform from left to right. And there can be a variety of different uh, solutions around manufacturing, production as a service, modular manufacturing, what we can establish here. So what you see on the right hand side is only one example, how we, for example, connect the dots for us carbon footprint tracking. And this could go over many, many different solutions in there. But we are saying all the way how the interoperability is generated, it's always the same methodology and always the same approach. So by saying that, 
and especially for the manufacturing era, we realized Catena X is also not a small initiative. If we're really serious about creating a truly open and shared data ecosystem, we need to connect more than 275,000 legal entities, for example. You know, the global automotive value chains are truly global and connected all around the world. So we need to have X locations connected, but it's also around platforms, applications, enabling user to give access and seamless access to such a wonderful data ecosystem. So what we decided, and that's what we are committed from Catena X and Frank is me as the ambassadors and the board members, we speak pretty open about that one. Two major goals, what you always need to um, yeah, yeah, take into account. One, we truly work on an open approach. So everything pretty much was created around Catena X follows a technology and architectural facility, which is on the one hand side decentralized and open. So the baseline components what we're creating about data sharing and connecting the dots across the value chain are built on an open source software approach. And the standards what we're delivering, they're also taking account existing standards, but also creating new standards, especially for the manufacturing area. No? And on the second side, it's truly collaborative what we're doing with Catena X. I think we can all agree who are connected to Catena X. We never see something happening over the last 15 years that an entire industry is coming together and all the different role models around an industry are working jointly together on this big, big project of OEMs, first tier, end tiers, small, medium sized companies, software providers, operators, but especially also for the manufacturing space, the IT and OT providers in such an ecosystem. So open and collaborative. If you're committed to these principles, you are highly welcome also to join Catena X and work together with us. So looking a little bit at the history, and that's also how it started. Of course, you can always say Catena X, or oh, it looks pretty like a German initiative and we're building this data-driven value chain in this ecosystem only for Germany. And it is true. I mean, the two years ago, it was a set of 28 German companies who start, let's jump to this and let's prove that we can also deliver because making nice concepts and architectures, we saw a lot of initiatives in the market of doing this, but we never saw someone who is stepping up and said, yes, we are a delivery organization and we will build this. So the 28 first companies, what you see here, out of the different areas, and especially for manufacturing with the IT OT perspective, they went on the way and said, we are a delivery organization and we will prove that the system works and we are committed to adopt this system from our side of data sharing. And there are three key delivery or deliverables, what we said, this is what we are committed on the 28 companies. We will deliver all the technology components which are relevant for the data sharing, trusted data sharing across the value chain for manufacturing data, logistic data, whatever it is. And we built even on top of that 10 compelling use cases, which are pretty, pretty much relevant to the entire automotive industry. And the third big mission from us said, we are not doing this only for 28 companies. We're doing it for a complete industry and a complete ecosystem. So scaling and onboarding of new partners, this is one of our core missions to let the network or the ecosystem grow as, as much as possible. So, and from there, of course, we come jump now a little bit into technology and the different areas. What you see here is pretty much a very simplified snapshot of, hey, how does this system work from a technology perspective? And if you look on the right, on the left-hand side, you see the core components from an IT architectural perspective, how Catena X works. And therefore, it's pretty, pretty nice to understand all the orange boxes, this is pretty much all the technology services, what we need to enable all the proprietary platforms and let them speak together and let them share the data on a very trusted, neutral and interoperable way. And one key highlight, what we always say, what is just on the movement and just in the shipping from our side, this is exactly this trusted handshake. Always think about how can two production platforms trust each other and share the handshake each other of sharing data this is exactly happening to this Eclipse data space connector, what we're just providing and developing in Catena X. And guess what? Using this Eclipse data space connector, 
generates also a lot of value for both sides because from a Volkswagen side, for example, we can embed it, embed it into the digital production platform. From a Siemens or SAP perspective, we can pro uh, embed it into our proprietary platforms of an ERP system. And from there on, we're sharing the same language and speaking the same language. And on top of it, this is also very important always to us, the solutions or the applications which you need to fulfill then actually an end-to-end -end approach, this is exactly where we said, 100% competition and 100% openness. We don't force any of the players of the ecosystem to use one of the proprietary solutions or applications. Whatever application is Catena X ready, you're free to choose and free to adopt from your side to build a carbon footprint or whatever it is. So looking a little bit at the, uh, at the use cases, and this is a snapshot of the first 10 use cases Catena X is currently built. And of course, there are some fundamental use cases where we just need to work on to connect the data dots and also the complete value chain. You see it in the lower area. These are the use cases for parts traceability, business partner management, or different areas where we just say, hey, we just need to connect these different value chains and start the foundation. But what you also see, and this is you know, the interesting part about looking at manufacturing on production in the middle layer, you see a set of pretty, pretty compelling use cases around manufacturing and production. And it's obvious. I mean, if we're thinking about data sharing, there is value. There is value in sharing data for production relevant topics. Let's say, for example, in the left hand side, manufacturing as a service. If we really can have access to all the machines which are currently in the ground floor and optimize their the capacities, or even if you want to optimize the sharing of data information around these machines, then there is value into that one. If we're thinking about adopting the whole concept of modular manufacturing, this is clearly something what we have in focus with CatenaX. And last but not least, also sharing the different the demand and capacities from all the machines which are connected on the shop floor through a network, then we immediately realize hey, this has value potential on and on and on. As I said before, also for the whole system around compliance and sustainability, these data are relevant to manufacturing sites. This is something what we are exactly building with CatenaX and sharing to the centralized and decentralized networks. So of course we could go now into the different areas of the use cases, but for production relevant use cases, just let me share one idea about this demand and capacity management. And this is also coming together if you say, hey, our machines currently on the shop floor, we truly believe they have so much more capacity in left and right. And of course, I mean, cumulated demands on the one hand side and on the other side, having the right capacity. This is something what we really bring together now to avoid this bullwhip effects and also this short term costly production adjustments, what we always have and having this missing single source of tools of monitoring, getting everything together. So what you see here is basically a snapshot about this demand and capacity management use case, where on the one hand side, different OEMs, different production companies can share their capacities, for example, from uh, the machines, everything what they have in uh, supply side available, if it's components, machines, production tools. And on the other side, we have, of course, the OEMs sharing their demands and having this joint view on a holistic monitor, and this is a snapshot now, what you see here, potentially from our side, what SAP is, for example, building joint monitors of supply and capacity plannings within the global network. And once again, all the data what are shared here are 100% sovereign, they're 100% neutral, and can be shared through this trusted value system. And it doesn't matter if it comes from a, a Volkswagen system, a Mercedes system, a Bosch system, ZF system, whatever it is, this is truly globally interoperable for manufacturing data all along the value chain. So by saying that and coming a little bit to an end, where are we standing with Catena X? Catena X, and this is really important to us and especially for Frank and me, because Frank is responsible for the internationalization of Catena X. One thing what was really clear from our side, Catena X is not built only for the German or the European market. We truly believe we are in a global ecosystem and we are offering this global ecosystem and this collaboration to the entire world. We had tremendous demands already from different companies all around the world. 
And you know, you see it already in all the companies which have joined already Catena X. It's more than 120 companies who all around the world joined our mission and are delivering and connecting already to the system like Stellantis, Ford, Brembo, all around the world we have this, but also especially with focus on the Japanese market, we are super happy that companies like Denso, Asai Kase or DMG Mori are already joining the ecosystem and driving this forward. So by saying that, of course, we have a roadmap and Catena X is going live actually by the end of this year and you can connect to this global data ecosystem. But as I said at the end, what we always said, and I hope this is also something for our panel discussion later, we see Catena X really as a global fitness program for all of us. Yeah? The potential and the challenge what we see is delivering this next generation of automotive processes for an entire end-to-end -end value chain. We truly believe that this ecosystem is open and multi-vendor approached. We need to be flexible in sharing the data. And of course, we say we always give the full data sovereignty back to the companies where it belongs to. And from there, we can drive innovation and always think about virtu vertically everything what Frank has shown, what happens within a company. We are on a super fantastic way there already, but also we do it now hor horizontally across the complete value chain of automotive. And with that, I would give back to the uh, moderator and also hand over to the last part of our presentation and then go back to a panel discussion. Thank you very much from my side. Thank you very much, Mr. Hoibach. So this is going to be the last presentation the manufacturing approaches for the digital age. I'd like to invite Professor Shirasaka. Thank you, I'm Shirasaka from Keio University. I'd like to start the presentation titled Manufacturing Approaches for the Digital Age. Let me share the slides. So manufacturing approaches for the digital age. To begin with the presentation, I'd like to first discuss what we need to do in the manufacturing industry. What area of the manufacturing industry is affected by digital technology? We take things and services we make as system. So it is about systems design. What is system design? To begin with, I'd like to talk about defining goals, defining challenges, or defining values that we want to provide. What we need to do, first of all, is to define and decide what we want to aim for. You can say by offering music, having people rejoice in it. That could be a goal that you can set. To realize this goal, what can we do? There are means that we can use. By effectively combining these available means, we will be able to realize the goal that we set. So combining the means is really about system architecture. And when you set the goal, the goal must be set in a way that it is realizable by combining available means. Of course, you know what is the best possible combination based on one's experiences. Now that we have digital technologies, what is happening to this process? Let me explain. This is the scope of system design. In this scope, what is happening? Suppose we have this system already in place. You can simply change this into a digital system without changing the goal. So there is only a slight change necessary to the architecture part, this triangle part. But essential changes we see are really about digital means, newly available, which means that by utilizing new means, digital means, the purposes and goals that were unattainable in the past can now be realized 
So this is really about transformation. So digital transformation is about using the digital technology, changing the goal setting, realizing what was not possible before. So this is not the extension of the past goal setting. Let me repeat once again, because there is a new set of means available. The old way is no longer valid. Defining goals is not simple anymore. So what do we need to do? Utilizing digital meeting, we need to set feasible goals. Naturally, we need an architecture mechanism to realize a goal. By combining means, now with digital means, what becomes achievable? This is something that we need to understand. This makes the goal setting more challenging. Employing or educating digital skills, the goal setting it's not made easy. How to realize the goal, how to design the architecture are not easy questions. So knowing about the digital technology is not enough. Knowing how to achieve the goal using the digital technology is necessary. That will be the key. Now in the digital age, what is taking place in the manufacturing? Since time is limited today, I'd like to focus on three things. These three keys are, first of all, to create a value. The scope that we need to consider is changing because of the digital technology. This is the prerequisite to define a goal. This is caused by, in Japan, what's called Society 5.0. So this is about aiming for human-centered society by highly integrating the cyber space and the physical space. So the tight integration is important here. What it means is originally we have a cyber space and physical space separately, but we humans were the intermediators doing during society 4.0. For example, we humans input a destination. Our routes will be displayed on the phone so we can move to the destination just by looking at the routes on the phone. And we had human intervention there. But this is no longer true. Say your phone may be able to get a destination from your Google calendar, automatically a car will arrive and take you to the destination. But it's not just that. Beside that story becoming reality, the cyberspace and the physical space, since they are tightly integrated now, in the first place, the cyberspace is already connected through the internet. Physical space looks as if it is synchronized. For example, if you make a reservation at the hospital, a car will come to get you. If the car gets cold in congestion, the information will be sent to the hospital. Your reservation time gets adjusted automatically, as if the hospital and car are connected. Hospital and the car were discrete before, but they are connected. This is called the system of systems. If I will explain the definition of a system of systems, for example, here in this example, there is a Canon EOS system and HP's printer system. When they are connected, it's a system taking a photograph with Canon to print it on HP. What is the difference now from independent camera or a printer system? It is now a system where no one guarantees it functions end to end. If it fails, no one knows who's to blame. If it's a camera that fails, you would call Canon. If it's a HP printer, you would call HP. But with this system of systems, can we call Canon or can we call HP or can we call a cable manufacturer? We don't know because it's all connected. The connected systems like this creating values are increasing. Are there many examples of these? Yes, smart cities, smart grid, industry 4.0, IoT systems, 
all, they are all systems of systems. Our society now depend on them. Furthermore, Society 5.0 aims to make it human-centric. What does that mean? We often talk about the user's journey. It is about explaining how users would use a system and provide values during that usage. And we have already done that in the areas like hospitality, mobility, and drugstores. So our society is, is increasingly connected. Our lives are not divided by the use of the hospital, mobility service, or the drugstore. There is always a linked flow, as I said earlier. We make reservation at hospital, a car will get you there, the information will be sent to the drugstore. So by the time you get to the drugstore, your medicine's ready to pick up. So it's a completely connected flow. But there is a head up. Does everyone use a car? Not necessarily. It could be a bus, it could be a train, a bicycle, or maybe a walk. Or you may want to pick up your prescription immediately after the hospital, or you may want to go shopping first. So the value that is created depends on what systems get connected. And this is a new digital co-creation domain. Value creation depends on systems integrated. Conventionally, a car can be made based on its own journey, car's own journey. But when values are connected by cars being connected to other systems, the way it's manufactured will change. But system of systems, it is not a product that directly provides values. It is the connection to other systems that provide values. So a car that have value creating connectivity will be competitive. So the source of competitiveness shifts. The manufacturing must also go along with that shift. So it's not just the way one makes product that brings us to the second point. That is the changes in the context. You may have heard VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. The acronym VUCA, the United States DOD came up with, indicates that our society we live in undergoes rapid changes. And with Society 5.0, connectedness increases the degree of VUCA. For example, suppose the environment change influence something called A. A alone is affected. When A and B are connected, B is affected as if A's influence infects B. When B is altered, when B is affected, the change in B gets back to A. In other words, it's a connected society. It is more susceptible to its external change. Rather than evading this, the key is for the manufacturer to rebuild themselves as, so that they can respond to change. So the question is how that's possible. First, DEO's process. Japan proposed, we made it into an IEC standard. This is a double layered process. Internally, the red arrow process represent the conventional process to repair dysfunction, such as PDCA improvement cycle. Externally, on the outside, a blue arrow loop is a system to respond to external change, to cope with external change. In other words, we need to equip ourselves with means to cope with external change. To be able to do so, we must know what external change affects our internal system that we have built. So this is about how to design the system. It's the designer who comes up with the hypothesis of external change. The DEOS represent dependability engineering for open system. If you compare an open system with a closed system, a closed system assumes external relations can be fixated. So that's a closed system. An open system is different. When we make something, we set requirements. The fact we can set the requirement 
means external relations are fixed. When relations change, the requirements change. Instead of saying that we cannot make any product, the key is how to deal with the change. Thus, we need a process or system to do so. There's one more thing we need that is a design to make it easier to cope with change. For example, on the left hand side, sorry, this is Japanese. This is a simplified diagram of an autonomous driving project that we assist. When it comes to external environment, the car must stop at the red light. This traffic rule does not change. Now that we use a camera to recognize a red light to stop a car, but in not so distant future, with vehicle to infrastructure communication, a car gets the information of a red light through communication, stopping the car. Stopping with camera to stopping with communication. This is a change. That's where we need a design that is easy to accommodate change. Perhaps a modular design. One can swap a camera module with a communication device when change is necessary. If this design thinking is applied, accountability is also ensured. A car stopping at the red light is the same as before. How does a car recognize the traffic light? How does it stop? This spot changes in design. And this design process needs to explore change in advance. And thirdly, systems characteristics. Recently, we often use utilities and of familiar words, such as reliability, availability, and maintainability. These words have utilities at the end. We refer to them all together as illities. This includes security, although it does not have illity at, at the end. They constitute a specialty engineering, a discipline of systems engineering. More recently, it's common to use the word illities in the industry. Simply put, all the properties and characteristics that we could not figure out unless you get system-wide view, for example, security. A partial view does not assure you a whole system is secure or not. Safety is another example. Characteristics that you couldn't understand without the holistic view. Abilities can be explained as life cycle properties in English. So what happens around here, this is an excerpt from MIT paper. We've had ability words such as quality, safety, and reliability. Each line represents different kinds of abilities. Some were there for a long time. Others are more recent, such as the interoperability and sustainability. These are new additions. We see more of these ability lines. And look at the vertical axis. This is the log scale number of papers publicized. The papers are increasing, meaning not just many more abilities, system characteristics, but their importance is also higher and higher. In addition, there is an increase in requirements demanding proof. A good example is functional safety. 26262 standard for a car is an example. RAMs for railway, reliability, availability, maintainability, and safety. More recently, security is added to RAMs, RAMs plus. So these are examples. The key here is that the bottom-up approach is not going to work for systems characteristics. It can only be accounted for with top-down approach. This means top-down accountability is now demanded. So simple bottom-up design would not do. Often Japan-made goods are well-made, ensuring majority of use cases. But when we were asked to prove safety in all use cases, we all stopped to think because we have not been trained to do so. It's often say Japanese people are not good at this. It's not true. It's a matter of education. There are many who can, who are capable. We have not had many opportunities of logical thinking. 
decomposing things, making it hard to prove that we need to do this. So summing it up, with digital technologies, we need to define new goals, giving thought to values of manufacturing created from connected systems, or system of systems. So it's not just an extension of the conventional goal setting or value definition. That is what the digital or system of systems means to us. Understanding this, defining a goal, an architecture. Without designing an architecture, achieving the set goal is not enough. Design must be done in a way it withstands external change. A process must be described. For example, what external change a designer has assumed must be clearly described. Lastly, system characteristics must be accounted for, they must be accountable. This demands the top-down logical thinking in the manufacturing industry. The bottom-up manufacturing would not suffice. All of these things are happening today. We're looking at multiple systems being connected while changes are rapid. How can we account for a product being properly made? That is what the digital age demands us to do. True, it's increasingly challenging, but conversely, all of us have just made a fresh start. So it's also true that there's there are new opportunities arising where there have been none. The conventional winners may lose their cutting edge. We need to acquire needed capabilities quickly to set goals, to design architecture, to realize the goals, and to respond to changes and account for systems characteristics. That's what we need. With that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you for listening. Dr. Shirasaka, thank you very much. We now would like to move on to panel discussion. Once again, I would like to introduce the panelists. First, from Volkswagen, Mr. Frank Waller. And from Katena X, Mr. Hagen Boybach. And from Keio University, Dr. Seiko Shirasaka. So, Dr. Shirasaka will join us for the panel discussion part. And I will be moderating uh, this session. My name is Sugiye from Future Cooperation. Today's panel discussion, uh, we will be spending about one hour, and we have three major themes for this panel discussion. The first theme is the manufacturing and engineering in digital era and understanding that. So first, we heard from Frank San on his presentation. He talked about the cases in Volkswagen. So we'd like to ask questions uh, to Frank San to deepen our understanding on the case. And the second theme is about the digital ecosystem. So including Japan, we are about to create digital ecosystem, but what kind of ecosystem are we creating uh, rather than focusing on that, we want to focus on the process of creating the ecosystem, what we need to do to create the digital ecosystem. Based on the Katena X case, we'd like to think about that together. And the third theme is the collaborative system of PSSs as social infrastructure. PSS is product service system. RRI is currently considering this manufacturing as a service. 
And in creating this ecosystem for mass, what do we have to do from the Germany and Japan perspectives? We want to have discussion on that. So once again, thank you very much uh, to the panelists. We look forward to the discussion. Before we start the discussion to the members of the audience, I'd like to make an announcement. If you would like to ask questions, please go to the Q&A website from the YouTube and please enter your name and affiliation in your question. And after the panel discussion, we will be spending some time on the Q&A to take the questions from the audience. Now, let's go to the first theme, the engineering and manufacturing in the digital era. First, I'd like to ask Frank-san the first question. So listening to Professor Shirasaka, um, I understood that the overall design as a system is quite important. In your presentation, Frank-san, you also talked about the architecture and Volkswagen, and there is a data layer, and then AWS and the Volkswagen system and shop floor were all connected in that chart. And then it will be collaborating with the Catena X. So the overall design as a system in Volkswagen, how did you discuss that design in Volkswagen? How did you create that? Thank you for this question. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, there are two answers to that question. Um, the, the first uh, answer is really on the technical base. Um, uh, Professor Shirasaka really explained it nicely. Um, it's really a system of system because the Volkswagen world is very big. And we have seen in the last 10 years that our system is getting more and more complex. And uh, it was obvious that we need a redesign, a reinvention of our old legacy world. Um, because with the old legacy world, there is no chance to bring our production into uh, more prediction and more autonomous um, design. Here we discussed with several um, companies, uh, for example, with SAP, with AWS, but also with Siemens, how can we build um, a system on new pillars and we have a free we have free pillars so free pillars means we build on SAP because SAP is already in our world installed and so we said that's a, 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 a one element we have to have we want to have the second the second pillar is is the Siemens world with team center with, with the planning so that we have a clear combination or clear um, uh, interaction and clear link from the production development, from the product, sorry, from the product development into the pro production um, uh, planning. So that is the Siemens world. And the third pillar is the process world. Here we talked intensely with um, AWS um, to learn how they would do it. So that was a technical setup and we have these three pillars. And we also add additional elements if we see something is developing. So we, we are also doing iter iterations and Catena X is for example, one iteration because Catena X was not defined uh, in the time we have defined our strategy, but we see it as important thing. But the second thing I want quickly to, to mention is that we have also described the change story the change journey. So we have learned that from AWS um, in the very beginning. So three and, a, three and a half years ago, we have written a so-called press clipping of the future. So we have described in a text, how would the production world in Volkswagen look like in 10 years time? How would a press clipping in a newspaper look like if, for example, Volkswagen is uh, presenting the new production set up in the new production architecture in maybe 2030. And this press clipping is really helping us to, yeah, to, 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 to tell the story of the future setup in our production. 
And um, also we, we have written several narratives to really describe the future, uh, the future setup and the future picture we want to go for, we want to achieve. And that is the way we, we also do an update on this uh, narrative and these press clippings. And we do um, iterational steps to, yeah, to, to bring our strategy into, into the next level. Thank you very much. And one more point related to the previous question. So you're currently creating this future vision and you already have this legacy system. So from legacy system to the future vision, you have to make that transition. Mm -hmm. So the transition process, you have to design the process itself. So what mm -hmm. kind of challenges are you facing and how are you trying to overcome these challenges? Because in Japan, Japanese companies, um, when, when it comes data linkage, especially sharing the data of the plant, Japanese companies tend to feel it's risky, so they are hesitant mm -hmm. to do that. But mm -hmm. is it happening in uh, Germany? Is it happening in Volkswagen? And what are other challenges that you are facing? Uh, um, thank you. Thank you for this question. A very good question. Um, also, two answers. Um, yes, it is dangerous to do the transformation. Um, but yes, we have to do it. And um, there is uh, always the problem that we are a running company. And each company with a running production knows that the production has to run 24 hours a day, uh, five days a week. And if the production is not running, we have a big issue because then you don't sell your products or you produce your products. Therefore, um, we have started not in the very heart of the process. So we are not starting with the very core processes like the factory control process. So I have shown you the example with computer vision. I have uh, shown you several other uh, elements uh, we are working on. And using these elements or implementing these elements, we learn more about our systems and uh, the new, the new um, concepts we want to bring into production. Um, but changing those, those elements or bringing those elements in is not risking our production process or the steady flow of production. And after two, two years time, three years time, now we have the confidence that we are starting to change also the factory control and uh, the management of our data. And this is then more, um, how to say, a surgery on the open heart. Now we, now we start after some learning time, we start changing the key processes, um, but now we are more confident to do these first steps. We wouldn't start in the very beginning with the, with the most critical changes. So we start small, we do the first steps, we learn, and then we go to the bigger steps. That is the one thing we are doing. The other thing is also very important, um, uh, we are metal guys. We 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 do we do uh, bolts and nuts and plastics and metal metals uh, and engines, and we are not data data driven guys. But we want to become a data driven company, and therefore we have to teach our people. We have to teach our management what is a data uh, ecosystem, what is a data semantic structure, what is a data model. And this is also something you have to do. You have to explain how important data are and how to work differently with data. And that is also something we have started in parallel so that we learn about the new um, ecosystem, the new systems, and we have um, not started with the most critical process to change. To, to change. Thank you very much. So based on what uh, Frank San just said, I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Shirasaka. So we heard about the challenges in Germany and how they're trying to cope with the challenges in Germany. So um, Dr. Shirasaka, I think you understand very well the challenges that Japanese companies are facing. So the stakeholders and players and Japanese companies what is your advice to these players in terms of the design of the system? Um, can you give uh, specific advices to the Japanese players? 
Thank you. Germany is really a, a good learning for us. For about two years, I was involved with Airbus, the Germany company, Daimler Chrysler Aerospace. I worked for that company for two years. Germany, people are really serious about introducing technology. They are a bit similar to who we are, similar to Japanese people. We often talked with a German colleague that we are similar to each other. I'm sorry to say this, but back in 2000, when I was in Germany, in terms of system thinking, they were not exactly good at systems thinking back then. Having said that, they have changed dramatically with Industry 4.0. With this new concept, they were able to visualize what they want to be. They were able to describe the future vision and they were walking towards that future vision. And they have this comprehensive view, holistic view, especially uh, automobile companies are leading this way. How Germany has achieved this success uh, there will be a lot of learning in there. One thing I thought was useful was that um, to start small and show the result, show how effective that could be. Another important thing I think is education to the management team, saying that uh, we have this data-driven ecosystem, how we are going to deal with data, what does that mean? We need to explain that to the management team so that they can be ready to start using data. There is a traditional craftsman in Germany as well. We do have craftsmanship in Japan as well. It's not just depending on the hunch of the craftsman utilizing data. You need to have a complete change in mindset. Make sure that you make that jump. I think they are becoming a data-driven company, being able to say that is a wonderful thing. So in order to make that shift, you need to show how effective the data-driven ecosystem can be to the management team. Some Japanese companies have already begun, some do feel the need. I really admire Germany, uh, German companies are actually doing this. Model-based development started in Airbus, I was there. Five years later, I was there for two years, but I went there after five years, they have evolved. And 10 years later, they've evolved further. But in Japan, we have three year cycle. Things will be completed and end in three years. But in Germany, they set a long-term goal. They keep updating, they keep moving toward the target, toward the goal. That is admirable being able to update a journey, setting the future goal, trying to understand what Volkswagen should be in 10 years. It's almost uh, impossible to have 10 year long activity in a Japanese company. Being able to update your vision, that is really a good learning, a lesson for all of us. It's not three years, you have to think in 10 years. That's something that we need to learn. On the other hand, I have become interested, how can you visualize the vision? How did you set up a team to write this long-term vision? They have to have IT, they have to have uh, manufacturing knowledge. That must be a team. How can you make that team how did you select the members for that team who actually created this long-term vision? Just wonder what is the size? How many people are in the team? Who are they in the team? Sorry, I talked too long. Thank you very much, doctor. So uh, Frank said about the formation of the team, um, is there any response from your side to the question from Dr. Shirasaka? Uh, yeah, okay. thanks for the question. Um, quick, quick answer here. 
Um, the team was not so big, um, but it was uh, driven by our uh, COO, so the, the, the chief uh, operational officer. And we set up the, especially for our digital production platform, we, we set up a team with uh, internally, it, the core team is maybe 30, 40 people strong, then with several externals. And this team uh, was driving the last three years the, the growth of the platform and the development of our standards. Um, and um, we, we um, supported that with um, several communication activities into our factories, into our brands. And this core team is more or less together, but you know, sometimes people are changing, they move to a different job or to a different position, but that's the core. And um, um, we tried to establish a communication on the top of the, the, the board members so that they really see um, yeah, quarter by quarter how we develop and how we progress. Thank you very much. Then just one more question to Frank San under this first theme. So Dr. Shresaka also talked about changing the mindset mm -hmm. and also changing skills or reskilling. Um, in Japan, the Kishida administration, the Japanese government, decided to secure a budget for reskilling of 1 trillion yen in five years. So to change the mindset of the employees or the stakeholders and to reskill them, how did Volkswagen go about that? Um, we are still we are still in the in the middle of that process, and I, I, I congratulate uh, Japan that we have such a big uh, amount of money to do skill or, or, or capability building. Um, on our side, we. Um, we don't have that big uh, uh, budget to, to uh, create capabilities, but um, this is defined in each of our brands. So, um, you know, we have 12 different brands and all the brands, they have understood that digital capability is necessary on the shop floor level, but also on the, on the board level. And as I mentioned before, uh, for example, if you take me, I'm a digital immigrant. I'm, I'm not, uh, I was not grown up with a mobile phone in my hand. Um, so therefore we have to take care um, how the people with 40, 50 years really learn the stuff because they are the decision makers. And if they don't understand what the decision of the future will imply, then they will make the wrong decision. And um, here we have, um, we have some um, educational courses uh, we have some um, yeah, academy content where we train people, but the, the most important thing is we talk a lot about the content. So a use case, explain how a use case is changing the process, how um, a user journey, the user experience is developed in the future. Uh, for example, last year we had a big workshop with our board members to explain the user experience of a shop floor worker along the whole factory. In the future so how does this look like how does he or she use the new analytics um, um, tools and and, and um, applications and we have to make yeah we have to make it sink into our daily work so that they really see it and then um, it will build capabilities thank you very much uh, we actually have a lot more questions that we want to ask you, but uh, we have to move on to the next theme because the time is quite limited. Yeah. So let's move on to the second theme, which is about the digital ecosystem. What kind of processes do we need to take to create the ecosystem? We'd like to hear from Hagen Sam from Katena X based on uh, their initiative and we want to deepen our discussion on this topic. So the first question is about Katena X. There were 28 companies at the beginning. That's what you mentioned in your presentation. So to create these things, elements in the uh, ecosystem, you said that you needed more players, including small and medium enterprises. I believe uh, that's the case, but there are many SMEs. There are different types of SMEs as well. So what kind of SMEs 
do you think will be involved in forming the ecosystem? Because what in SMEs, it's difficult to dedicate a person in charge, unlike large corporations. So how are you going to involve the SMEs in the process? How are you trying to incentivize the small and medium enterprises? If there's anything that you are doing in this regard, please let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. And also, I mean, setting this in a bigger context and, and following also the discussion from Frank and Shirazakasan. I mean, if you take Catena X and put it also a bit in the broader context of society 5.0, what you're driving in Japan, one thing is really critical and remarkable. A, the world is really changing and the world is changing how we interact with information and let them flow across a complete value chain. Huh? And this can be focused very on specific topics like manufacturing, logistics, quality, whatever you take, but also can be around social data, can be around personal related data, can also be related around mobility data for the automotive eco space. And the one thing what is then remarkable of saying, what is the core baseline where an entire industry or an ecosystem can come together? And we at KTNX, we believed very early that data sovereignty and ensuring that the data will be interoperable with different organizations and different entities is really the key and core crucial. Because you will always struggle in an entire ecosystem to share data if there is no trust. And so if there is no trust, no one will share the data. And this is independent if it's production related data, quality data, logistic data, it doesn't matter. We need to guarantee at any time that the trust in the ecosystem will be there. So what does it mean now for Catena X and the focus what we have now? And we are focusing, as Frank and me always stating out, we're focusing at industrial related data, which is in there. One thing is also for sure, small and medium sized companies of course, they are a huge part to the entire value chain of automotive. Uh, and think about taking an example of putting a, a real carbon footprint together from a fully assembled car all the way down to the raw material. We cannot guarantee a fully carbon footprint if we don't connect the dots and put the small and medium sized companies together. So there is an incentive or there's a motivation, of course, from us, from Catena X, but also for large companies like OEMs and first years to have access to the data what the small and medium sized companies have. But vice versa, the small and medium sized companies, they also have a motivation to get access to the data on the upper chain, uh, what we have seen so far. So creating this win-win situation for both sides where big companies are getting motivated to get access data from small and medium sized companies, but small and medium sized companies getting motivated to have access from the upper value chain, this is really the key. So, and now is the big question, how we put both worlds together? Uh, well, Frank and me, and we could maybe say, yeah, we all working for big companies and we can run this transformation programs in our companies. This doesn't count for small and medium sized companies. They need to react and they need to change very fast to this new environment. And they need to transform also very fast to this new environment and they cannot run large IT transformational projects for six to 12 months. So that's why Catena X has decided we're putting a special focus on small and medium sized companies and get them an easy access to the ecosystem and the tools what we provide. It's similar about kits, what Frank is providing with the industrial cloud, we're providing kits for the Catena X space to connect to the system to get your value. So easy access and easy onboarding to the system will be core crucial for small and medium sized companies. And on top of it, and it's also where we can say from a German or European perspective, we are really lucky because the German government already committed to incentivize and help the small and medium sized companies to transform on their way. So there will be special incentive programs for small and medium sized companies to get onboarded to Catena X to transform into this new digital era. The key point is take Catena X out of the picture. It's all about transforming this small and medium sized companies into this digital world. Yeah, as Shira Sakasan said, 
this next generation of you know processes will always run across a complete digital value chain we need to be react flexible into that area and the decision makers they are not fully enabled into the digital era so we need to foster and stimulate this also from a governmental perspective and this is what we have motivated our government in germany of saying the government needs to re raise that spark and you know put this on the line of getting the small and medium-sized companies in the game they're absolutely critical for the success of the system Thank you very much. So we heard about the government, OEMs, and first tier and second tier. There are many players. So how is Catena X leading the initiative? While there are many different stakeholders, I know that the government and large corporations have their own roles. And what kind of roles are they playing in the conceptualization of this ecosystem? How is Katana X leading that process? For us, I mean, and it's also maybe Frank in a minute throwing the ball to you. It's always about being a role model not in Katana X. Of course, you need companies to, to show and to, to prove the world this is working. We all can give up our pride and work together uh, because as Shirazaki san said, if we're really thinking about the society 5.0, the world is open, interoperable, it needs to be connected. Yeah? But if no one makes the first step, no one will move. Yeah? So this is what, one of the first things big companies like us, like Volkswagen, Mercedes, but also from an IT perspective, SAP, Siemens, even Microsoft, we're saying we need to be role models and show the world that this system is, is working. So first step, Proof and be a role model that we can change our companies, we can change our system, first thing. Second thing is, we need to develop the tools and also the IT services to make the connection and the interoperability of data easy. If we do it like 10, 15 years ago and, you know, writing a lot of specifications and architectures, and then we're delivering on an IT system, we end up exactly what Frank, Frank mentioned in a monolithic system. We need to be cloud first, we need to be modular, we need to be more flexible to show quicker value to the market and to the system users. Because if we are not doing that, the system will fail in one, two years. So quick proof points and quick enabling also the end users, this is really something what is close to our heart and what we need to develop very fast into our tool. And on the third step, it's also our job and it's also our mission to enable exactly the small and medium-sized companies and all the players who are joining X regionally, but also especially globally. We all agree on that the great value of an automotive ecosystem also comes about the engineering companies, the small and medium-sized companies who are connected to this ecosystem. And if we can enable them to this ecosystem very fast, very easily and in time, then the win-win situation will come from both sides. And maybe throwing the ball over to Frank, you also saw it over the last one and a half years. This is, I think, where we're leading Catena X, no? Um, yeah, thanks, Hagen. Uh, if we have the time, I will, I will add maybe one or two thoughts. Um, first of all, I want to explain that all the players sitting in the association and in the board, like Hagen and like, uh, like I'm doing, it's really not that we are talking for our companies. We are sitting together as a team for Catena X. So there is BMW, there is Bosch, there is Siemens, there is uh, SAP, uh, really big companies, uh, global players. But there is never the, 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 the feeling that someone wants to put his own agenda into the, into the race or into the, uh, to the agenda. It's always Catena X. So we want to contribute, we want to deliver, we want to create something bigger. And if we manage to keep that spirit also for each participant, then we will, we will be succeeding in the process. This means everyone, every company want to join has to have an understanding. I want to contribute in this network. I cannot only sit down there, be passive and be a, a consumer 
but I have to contribute to make this happen. And if this mindset will last in the next two years, then definitely something sustainable will grow. Uh, at, at the end, we are in the in, in, uh, incubation time at the moment, and we still need the energy to build it up. And, and that's, that's for me the key thing, that everyone wants to contribute and to collaborate in that system. Back to Hagen, thanks. Thank you very much, Hagen-san and Frank-san. So based on uh, the discussion, um, Dr. Shirosaka, I have a question. In Japan, it's difficult to have the private company lead such initiative and have a um, relationship between the OEMs and uh, first and second tiers to have such eye-to-eye -eye level relationship. When it comes to Industry 4.0, Society 5.0, it's very difficult uh, that uh, private companies um, are having a hard time leading such initiative to achieve that vision. But um, I think that Japanese companies have an option of participating in Katina X going forward. What are the barriers um, that Japanese companies are facing uh, that they need to overcome to make that kind of relationship? Thank you. In Japan, first thing that I can say is that we have high walls between different verticals, different industries. In the private sector, as well as in the public sector, the governments are siloed depending on what they are in charge. They are in charge of different vertical industries. So we have never really tried to go across these walls, borders. So we feel it's challenging, but I think in the past, a long past, Germany was in the same situation. But with Catena X, you were able to go beyond the industrial silo, you were including SMEs, inviting everybody to participate. This is really a win-win relationship that you were building in Catena X. On the other hand, in Japan, when there are a lot of people forming a group, they tend to become somehow silent. They would not share their opinions. Earlier, um, Frank San said that they are trying to contribute to the network. But in Japan, we participate in a big group to get the information. So you need to be careful about how to build an organization that works. It's true that uh, Hagen-san said that the big companies need to be the role models. They have to showcase how the system works. So combining different industries, having shared data across industries. Perhaps in Japan, we are not feeling that it is going to work, but the big company can lead the initiative showing that this works. Small and medium-sized companies, for example, just like Germany, we have many SMEs in Japan and they are supporting the industries here in Japan, it's similar to Germany. Having said that, uh, we tend to think SMEs are simply subcontractors. They are the downstreams of the chain. But we need to make sure initiative that we create must be a win-win to SMEs as well. Just there are some efforts made in different industries. Uh, one example is on the automotive industry. They are trying to promote data exchange that can be beneficial to SMEs as well. But they have not been able to go beyond the industrial border. It's a high hurdle. And I think much depends on how the government is ready to break down that borders. We now have the digital agency that is really 
cross-industry government organization, this can be an opportunity to make the change. Utilizing this new agency, we may be able to go beyond the industrial border to realize Society 5.0, and I believe this will eventually provide much bigger values to citizens. We need that belief in it. We have to have industrial leaders like Athena X that can lead an initiative like that. Then we will be able to make some progress. We see some signs of that, not up to the level of Catena X, but we are seeing the signs of some companies are taking on this challenge following a similar path. I have personally great expectation on what Japan can do. Thank you very much, Dr. Shirasaka. So now we want to move on to theme three about the collaborative system of PSS as a social infrastructure. RRI for the last several years has been discussing manufacturing as a service and discussing the collaborative system of PSSs as a social infrastructure. And to achieve this, what are the steps that we need to take? RRI has been drawing that roadmap. So we want to consider manufacturing as a service and create the future vision. Manufacturing industry was focused on selling goods, but now they need to shift to providing added value. And it's not just about the manufacturing industry, but it would also go to mobility, energy, or healthcare industries as well. So they need to collaborate with other digital ecosystems in providing these services. That is what uh, we are envisioning for the future manufacturing industry. And in creating this, what are the ideas? Uh, that's what we would like to discuss, spending the remaining time of the panel discussion. So first, Frank-san, I'd like to ask you the first question. Manufacturing as a service. When it comes to that, the modules of manufacturing, how can we design the modules of manufacturing? That is a very important topic. And you talked about the building blocks. And also, you also talked about uh, the AWS concept. Uh -huh. So, service module, what is the process that you took to design the service module and what were the key, what, what was uh, something that you uh, valued? Uh -huh. um, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I want to s separate um, or to clarify that the answer I want to give. If we talk about manufacturing as a service, we could also think about sharing production capacity for other products. So um, simple example, like a Foxcom, you know, we can, uh, a company can produce also other products, but that's not a topic we are discussing here. Here we are really talking about um, IT and software solutions that could be also offered for um, other uh, production units. Uh, and for example, within Catena X, there is also the plan to have a manufacturing as a service. Um, uh, let's take for quality. If I bring a, produ a product, a car to the market and the customers are using those products, uh, those cars, um, failures occur, problems can occur. And um, having a, a proper data chain in place, we can collect those data from the market, from the usage by the customer and we can bring back that uh, data and that experience, that product experience back to an analytic system. And based on that, we can improve the manufacturing process and the product on the product itself. That could be a very simple uh, manufacturing as a service topic each manufacturer can use um, if you ride a bicycle or drive a car. So that could be a one thing. I also have shown you the, exa the example of um, industrial computer vision. Um, our industrial computer vision concept is um, observing cars and production of car, but we can also 
think about applying that to food industry or applying that to construction if you build a house or a, a, um, an asset. So therefore, we always have to think about the user experience with the software, what kind of value add can this software solution deliver to our customer. And uh, we have learned within Volkswagen that we always think ourselves, is this usable internally? Yes, it is. And then the second question, is there a customer with a similar problem out of Volkswagen? And is he or she interested in using that? And that is the one page I have shown in my presentation, something we also are doing more and more. And I'm pretty sure in one, two years, we have even more solutions on the market. Thank you. Next question goes to Hagen san. Catena X indeed is a service, so I think that they are designing modules. That is my understanding. And as we heard from you, Catena X is not just for the auto industry, but rather it can collaborate with other digital ecosystem and promote industry 4.0. That I think is uh, what Ketena X is about. So the design of collaboration uh, with other systems, what kind of discussion are, are you having on that topic in Ketena X? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's glad that you bring it up because at the end, when we're talking about manufacturing as a service, or as we call it nowadays, even anything as a service, it's totally independent from which industry you related on. Uh, I mean, thinking from an automotive perspective to industrial manufacturing, where a lot of the industrial machineries are standing on site, you know, at the manufacturing plants and changing the business model there. Of course, you are in a minute then related to how do I access this data? if I'm not selling the machine anymore, if I'm just subscribing it or if I'm just leasing or renting it out. No? Because if I'm still in control and having access to the machines, I need to be aware that the data which are flowing across these machines need to be interoperable and need to be you know, across an entire value system. So doing the transfer from Catena X automotive industry focus to the industrial machinery world, that was an easy one and probably also the most mature, because especially for the industrial and machinery industry, there are clear signs that the whole industry is coming together in a similar way as we did for automotive, uh, and to leverage also the baseline uh, insights and the baseline achievements, what we have already done with Catena X, that's a tick in the box. The interesting thing is, and Frank and me and the other board members, I think we can tell a nice history around that one, there is not one week actually where other industries are reaching out to us uh, asking for, hey, how can we replicate, you know, the insights or the methodology what we have achieved with KTNX to other industries. We're talking about high tech with the entire semicon industry. We're talking about retail for food chains. It's even we're talking about healthcare or pharmacy where we sit, okay, how can we prove that vaccination data are actually deployed in an end-to-end -end data driven value chain. And here comes the interesting thing about Catenex. Look, what we have done, we're saying we're delivering a truly open and collaboratively tool set with a baseline of technical services, which are basically applicable to many, many other industries. Why? Because a lot of these technical services, we call them federated services, they are on open source. They are published on GitHub and an Eclipse Data Foundation, where independently from an industry, many, many other players can actually log on, look into it, and can take them over into their other industry. Why? Because the baseline challenge is how you exchange data from A to B in an ecosystem in an industry. And once again, doesn't matter if it's industrial manufacturing where you need access to the machinery data or you need access to healthcare data. It's always the same. So reusing this data services and this technical insights, what we had from KTNX, yes, be our guests and welcome to replicate this into other industries. And I think this is one of the true 
yeah, I would say contributions Catena X also delivers to this next generation of industrial manufacturing. All the tools, all the methodologies are there. It's up to the industry now to leverage this and to use it. No. Thank you very much. On this topic, the next question goes to Dr. Shirosaka. So from selling goods to offering service, um, the Japanese companies are not very good at taking on this challenge, but the concept of system of systems, the entire system will have to be connected to other industries. But Japanese companies are not very good at transforming themselves, or the German companies are now trying to transform themselves. But in order for Japanese companies to take on this concept of system of systems and designing the modules, what do you think is the most important thing? Thank you for that question. What becomes most important is as we discussed for Catena X, I COO, Lee, uh, that's in the case of Volkswagen. There is a team led by COO. I think what we've done up to today is not mistaken. It's the environment that changes. We now have digital technology that connects things. And we now have access to a lot of data. We have much better communication today because of these changes what better value we can provide to users ask that question we need a system that can enhance customer values so it's the question whether the top management understands this the company that fails to do this will lose out in the competition. So making a decision to go for it or follow after others or lead the change, it's up to the strategic decision of the top management. It's their decision. So how they are going to make the decision is important. Having said that, there is a set of companies that have strong bottom-up approach. Of course, top management has to make the commitment. And then simply the top-down management could fail in Japanese companies. In Japan requires both top-down and bottom-up because we are good at involving everybody, making consensus for a change. So we need to spread the knowledge widely about what is happening today. There are many opportunities for everyone to get that information, though it's very difficult to understand how a system of systems can affect. There is another factor that is big in digital technologies, that is industry reorganization. The manufacturing as a service is a good sign of that. Uber Eats, for example. In the past, traditionally, we were able to ask restaurants to deliver food to different households. But this can be operated by third party. Because of that, they were able to establish a multi-site platform, making this whole traditional delivery as a service. Manufacturing industry can actually decompose tasks they conduct, making them each one of these tasks as a service. So anything as a service, you can create many services in different industry and there are many opportunities to do this a lot of things like visual inspection can be made as a service look at functions of piece of machine they can be made as a service but to do this you need to have data exchange 
being able to exchange data, you will be able to achieve a service like Uber Eats. But when you create a service, you may have multiple modules. Connecting all these modules by data, you can make these modules into services. This is actually happening more in other industries than manufacturing. And this will certainly occur in the manufacturing industry as well. So the people in front line will change and the top management must change. And if we can agree both top management and other workers, if they can create a consensus for change, I think we can quickly change because our improvement activities, Kaizen activities are basically for moving together for improvement. We were able to create this quality PDCA. You can actually create a consensus within a company for a digital change. It's not for quality this time around, it is the digital change and the mindset change. Thank you very much. Um, the time is limited, but we just want to take one question from the member of the audience. The question directs to Hagen san and Frank san, Katena X and Gaia X. How will it will be changing in the technology, but how is it going to change the way we work? That is a question. Uh, from competition to collaboration, is the way of working changing? Um, can you briefly comment on this question? Yeah, absolutely. Hagen, and I'm, you want to yeah, <laughs> Frank, no, I was, stop. Hagen, stop. In, in interest of time, I'm doing it very quickly and very on point. I mean, very glad that you bring up Gaia X. The first statement is. Yes, of course, Gaia X is also a big milestone or a big piece of the puzzle for Catena because we always said um, the, the reference architecture and the baseline principles of Gaia are also applying to Catena X in building the, the fundament of our service. That's the first thing. Second, yes, of course, it changes the work, how we um, actually collaborate from a pure competition and siloed approach of proprietary platforms of open ecosystems and collaboration. But guess what? I mean, that's either way the future. Yeah? If we look left and right, what's happening in the world and how, for example, other societies are planning with this. And this is a true thing, what I believe Japan and Europe have in common. We better apply ourselves in this openness and this interoperability because we need to be much more faster, open and interoperable either a way to succeed in this world. And this only can happen if we apply the technologies where we can trust in, that they are safe, that they are neutral and interoperable. Then we have a true chance, I think, in Germany and in Japan to survive and be really on a good industrial forefront. Frank, over to you. Um, uh, yeah, that is that is definitely the, the, the view on the on overall system. And if I take a look into the system, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we all have to learn what 100% of transparency does mean to us. Because uh, yesterday I was on the stage here in a supplier uh, um, affair and um, I asked the audience how much people, how much Excel files, how much telephone calls did we do in the last months to clarify where a semiconductor is or where a component is we need for producing our cars. And my dream is that this will be over. We will have the data available. We will have an application available where we have the full transparency where the material is, where the flow is stopped and where do we have buffers and where do we have a problem or where it's flowing properly. And the other thing is we definitely will better understand our environmental impact to the world. Because if we see how CO2 is emitted, how we pollute the, 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 the world, we have more uh, levers to improve here and to, to, to uh, create a better world in terms of sustainability and ecolog ecological footprint. So therefore, I'm really a big believer in, the, in Catena X with the long data chains, and that will really change our habits and the way we work. Thank you very much. I know that we can talk about many more topics, but unfortunately, the time has come to close the panel discussion on day one. 
So the symposium continues for four days, but I think that the, today we had a very good start. Uh, Frank-san, Hagen-san, and Dr. Shirasaka, thank you very much. And Hagen-san and Frank-san, thank you for joining us in a very early morning. So to close, um, day two, tomorrow, tomorrow's schedule is what I would like to touch upon. So tomorrow, October 12th in Japan, it will be from 7 to 9 p.m. Leaders Dialogue Integrated Service System of PSSS as a Social Infrastructure. We will hear from Japanese and American speakers. And then based on uh, today's theme three, we will hear on the discussion on digital manufacturing tomorrow. So I hope the members of the audience will come back and join us tomorrow again. Okay, then this concludes day one of the International Symposium, the panelists and the audience, thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.